What? Well, good morning, everybody. Ooh, could we turn that down just a little bit? <laughs> <laughs> so good to be back with you. And uh, I've missed this congregation. Even though we live in town now, uh, we still have our responsibilities with the uh, Christian church. But that doesn't keep us from loving you and missing you. Although we try to be here once a month at least, and I really appreciate this opportunity to be your pastor today. How about a group though? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Yes, we'll do a little pan too. Make sure to wave to the camera. <laughs> well, to all our mothers today, we wish you a very happy Mother's Day. And after the service is over, the children are going to present all the mothers a gift. And you men, if you have had a mothering experience, get in that line, okay? <laughs> you belong there, too. So, some of our announcements today are not on the screen, I think. Um, ah, there we are. The nominating committee is in need of one more members. So if anyone's interested, see Deanna Borges, the chair of the committee. Shasta Interfaith is hosting an educational forum on Monday, May 15th at 6 p.m. in the community room at the Reading Library. They're going to hear from Buddhists, Sikhs, Muslims, Jewish, and Christians who will share their experiences together. I'm going to be there, by the way. Now, there is a board meeting this Wednesday, May 17th at 6 o'clock. Don't forget the camp registration forms are due to the church office by Sunday, May 21st. Next Sunday, May 21st at 2 o'clock, there will be a blessing for Goodwater Crossing on site at St. James Lutheran Church for anyone who wishes to attend. And next Sunday, May 21st, the Reading Community Choir will be holding a choir concert, 3 p.m. here in the sanctuary. Are there other announcements that, oh, of course, unfortunately. <laughs> may I borrow your microphone? You may. I was watching myself on the Facebook video and I realized I really need to speak up. <laughs> um, this week for the thrift store, we need somebody to work the first half of the Tuesday shift, that's day after tomorrow. You'll be working with um, Sun and then you'll be relieved at, at about 2.20. And then we also need someone to work Saturday. We have a cashier for Saturday, but we need a floor worker from noon to 4.40 or some portion of that. So if you can do either of those, contact me. Thank you. Thanks, Marvie. Mm -hmm. Um, ordeal that she has to go through. 
but this, this week she is, um, they're sort of on their own, I believe, Julie, is that correct? Yes, it's just her and Michaela. She picked up Michaela yesterday, um, so Michaela will be with her. Michaela Tuesday, came Tuesday yesterday. she goes in for her surgery, and Michaela's going to be her caregiver. For two weeks? Is for that two correct? Weeks. Two weeks, uh, Michaela will be with her, which will be wonderful. Uh, but also, like, we want to provide them food. So anybody who's interested in doing that, whether it's a, a meal, we don't want to overwhelm them with food, starting next weekend probably, um, or even a plate of cookies, anything. Can yeah, we donate know. money for, um, like, somebody to buy the food? Sure. Yep, okay. sure, that would be great. And I'll, if, I'll have a list in the back today. I'll be in the kitchen, so just come in and sign your name up. So when you say we'll have a list, that's a sign-up list for you? Yes, but the okay. sign-up list for it is not made up yet. So we can still do that <laughs> next week. Okay. But I'm, I'm happy to take calls, uh, or today take names down and I'll contact you. <laughs> Thank you. So if there are no more announcements, <coughs> let us begin our worship service with <coughs> preparing us to do so.
Can you please stand for the call to worship? Modern life is complicated. In God's way is simplicity itself. Jesus said to take his yoke upon us. May we wear it well. In our worship today, we ask God to help us live the way of Jesus. For it makes life worthwhile for ourselves and others. Please join in our hymn 276, We Gather Together. You know, today is a very special day, isn't it? Mother's Day. Mother's Day, very good. Now, I imagine all of you have mothers. Yeah, that's good. What I want to know from you, remember our blink letters shown at the kids? Yep. One, one time you asked a child, what did your mother tell you today? She told me not to mess up my dress because we're taking it back to Macy's. <laughs> <laughs> so you never know what's going to happen here. But I'd like to know what it about your mother is very special to you. Can you tell me something? Or your grandmother? <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Where's the cat that got your tongue? <laughs> well, let me let me suggest something to you. I'm going to sit down, and I don't want to be so far away from you. Um, I think mothers are a lot like God. And you can learn a lot about God by the way your mother treats you. And here's some things. Your mother is always looking out for you. Your mother is always present with you in everything that you do. Your mother teaches you right from wrong. Your mother loves you beyond measure. All of these things, God does too. God will always be with you. God will always care for you. God will always enjoy your presence and have fun with you just like your mom does. And in some cases, God will even discipline us a little bit when we need to be corrected, just like your mom will do. Does that recognize any of that about your mother? Let's just say, uh huh. Uh huh. Okay. Now let's have a prayer and we will thank God for our mothers, okay? So how do we get ready to pray? Thank you. We thank you, God. We thank you, God. For our mothers. For our mothers. Who love us. Who love us. Watch over us. Watch over us. Help us to know. Help us to know. Good and not good. Good and not good. And will be with us always. And will be with us always. Through Jesus we pray. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much.
Oh, that's right. <laughs> Joe, I told you I'd be making a mistake today. <laughs> for mothers struggling to care for your vulnerable infants, demanding two-year-old <laughs> insecure juniors and trying teens and some in the audience. <laughs> we invite you into God's tent for respite. For all our mothers alive or living in our memories, for all mothers in the congregation and around the world, and for men and women who are graced in their daily lives, or from time to time with the gift of mothering. We celebrate this day and shout, Amen. Amen. We have uh, some things to include in our joys and concerns this morning. Um, I'd like you to know that uh, Deanna V awaits her report from the neurosurgeon to see what is going to follow her diagnosis. And of course, you know, uh, Pastor Janet is having shoulder replacement surgery on Tuesday. She'll be staying one night in the hospital, and her daughter, Michaela, will be in town to be her caregiver. After all, what are daughters for? <laughs> okay, uh, joys and concerns to share with the congregation? <laughs> Kathleen? Um, I have a joy and a concern. It's a group of girls that I grew up with are walking the Camino de Santiago from Portugal to Spain right now, which is a religious journey. It's about 250 miles, and uh, just want prayers for safety for them. Uh, I need to remind you, my hearing is such that I can't hear anything, especially from the back row. So what I do during the pastoral prayer, since I don't, I miss half of what people say, is we pause and let you pray uh, silently for what you have heard and other things on your heart. So I'm sorry about that, Kathleen. That's okay. Ron has got it, I know. Okay. Yeah. I just found out last night my sister-in-law has two kidney stones and she sees a, a surgeon on Tuesday to figure out the plan of attack. Yeah, uh, we're familiar with that. <laughs> uh -huh. just, prayers, please, for dealing with the baby, our new baby and the moms and the caregivers and things like that. I have a joy Ooh. to present with you a little token of our gratitude for you being with us today. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> Guy, do you want this? <laughs> That's a bigger joy for me. <laughs> <laughs> Your bookkeeper, huh? <laughs> Another joy or concern. Yes, it's good to be back in Reading, and I want to thank the congregation for the prayers and the calls and text messages that I receive. And as far as my son's health is concerned, we're not out of the woods yet. So please keep the prayers coming. God is good. Well, we're glad you're back with us again. You know, I could move forward. <laughs> uh -huh. Well, I have one joy. Um, John got his um, nerve study done on his leg and his back. And so hopefully Tuesday we'll have answers <clears throat> as to what can be done for him. And then my sorrow is that Seth couldn't join me this morning because he threw up as he was getting ready to do. <laughs> oh, no. That's often the case. Uh-huh. Um, this little guy got his first.
first two days of school. Yay! Um, so <laughs> it's a joy and a, you know, a little bit of sad. <laughs> 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 I'm working on the smiles. Here, <laughs> God, as we assemble here this morning, we assemble as a people who are concerned for one another, who understand <coughs> our relationships with one another are to be led by love, and who from time to time fail in our responsibility to each other and to the world. So we come to you asking for strength to be the people you want us to be. Strength to follow Jesus into our world as he led his disciples in his. Strength to realize that we need you to be who you want us to be and that we need each other. So as we worship this day, we do so wanting your presence to be felt more deeply, our love for one another to grow, and our ability to perform in our lives as you would have us with the priest. Help us to make our sphere of the world, where we have some influence, to be a better place for all involved. To be more like the world that you would like it to be, rather than the world as it is. For all the conflicts, hatred, abuse that we see around us, we pray for the victims and the victimizers that they may somehow realize your presence with them and that will change their lives. We pause now to consider what we've just heard from the congregation about people themselves and others that they love and other concerns that we have as we pray silently now. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus, who leads us into new life. Amen.
Well, in two weeks, the season of Pentecost begins, and I know you're very familiar with that. And during the months that follow, we celebrate the birthday of the church and consider ways to reorient the church to its original purpose. On the front page of your bulletin, you will find the vision of this congregation, what we hope to live out in the presence of God and the world. I'm going to read it to you. It says, Our congregation's vision is to affirm the love and presence of God in each life and in the world, and to learn and live by the teaching of Jesus of Nazareth. Believe me, these are difficult words. They're strong words and require a single-minded pursuit to achieve this vision. The key is found in the phrase, affirming the love and presence of God in each life and in the world. Well, it doesn't take much examination of the world to know that hatred prevails over love way too often. And it, it prevents God's world from coming into being. Yet God's vision for the world is for each person to behave toward others with love. How can we do this? Well, here's how poet Richard Avery summed up the attitude of many Americans. It's called, In the Presence of My Enemies. I don't want to talk to them. I can't get along with them. I am against them, and they're against me. Their opinions make me sore, and what they stand for, I deplore. I just want to turn away and walk out the door. I have no more time for them. I can't stand the sight of them. I'm against them and they're against me. All their problems I'll ignore. I just want to turn away and go out that door. Well, I can't say I'm immune from such thoughts. Maybe you aren't either. So how do we move on from these feelings and fully embrace God's love? And affirm God's presence is within each life and in the world. How do we do that? Well, it can only come from the second part of our church's vision, to learn and live by the teaching of Jesus of Nazareth. I like that it doesn't say the teachings, plural, of Jesus, for there really is just one teaching. All the things Jesus taught can be summed up in our text today. Very simply, love God and your neighbor. It's necessary to get back to this because the church, especially in America, has lost its way. But from the beginning of the church, the church has been politicized. Being politicized is being used for political gain and has been co-opted from its mission in the process. Politics is nothing more than the use of power to control people other than oneself. It can be in Congress, it can be at your kitchen table. In the book of Acts, we find that the Jerusalem church favored Jews from outside of Judea in the distribution of food when people were, Jews were stranded in Jerusalem because they came to the festival, heard about Jesus, and didn't want to go home, but they weren't prepared to stay for months. So what happened? The Jerusalem Jews first took care of their own. 
and later were forced to consider the rest of the Jews that were in town. Other Jews who followed Jesus wanted to exclude Gentiles from the Jesus movement. Later on, Emperor Constantine used the church to consolidate his empire and his rule. And later on, the popes became like emperors themselves. Such irony. Along the way, the church was converted from its role of servant to the world to its dominator. It burned or drowned presumed witches, killed or banished dissenters, fought wars and created a host of enemies. So far it went from Jesus' love ethic. There's a wonderful story in church history that illustrates it. In the book of Acts, we read that Peter was addressed by a disabled person asking for alms. And Peter said to him, Silver and gold have I none, but what I do have I freely give to you. Rise up and walk. A few centuries later, Thomas Aquinas walked into the Pope's, Peter's successor, counting house, where the Pope was counting out money on the table. And the Pope said, Thomas, look! No longer need Peter say, silver and gold have I done. To which Thomas replied, and neither can he say, rise up and walk. The reason, according to one of the best analysts of the early church, that the church lost its way is because it no longer was the servant of the world. It exchanged power for service. And when that happened, Christendom evolved, and we have struggled against it ever since. Now, the question becomes, how can we restore this original calling? And if we don't, the church will continue to be a problem and not the solution. Vince Lombardi, the coach of the Green Bay Packers, has the highest winning percentage in the history of the NFL. 73% of the games they played in, they won. Yet after a loss, he reminded his team of what got them the original victory. Blocking and tackling. And so the next week was all blocking and tackling so they could get back to their basics. When uh, I was in the Marine Corps, we marched and marched and marched and march and march. I got shin splints in both legs from all of that banging on the table. <coughs> After we graduated and we had a little more of an opportunity to have a real relationship with our DIs and not get shouted at or beaten up in some cases, somebody asked our DI, <coughs> How come we march so much? And he said, over the course of the three months that you're in basic training, you will have complied to thousands of commands. Left, right, left, right, June, halt, about face, forward, march, column left, column right. Isn't that right, or where'd you go? <laughs> <laughs> he was just about to 
to jump into the aisle. You know? <laughs> he said, well, after you've had these complied to these thousands of commands, when we order you into combat, you are going to jump to it without thinking, and that's why we do that. It's no wonder it's called basic training. Well, Lombardi and the Marine Corps understood the basics, and if we Christians are going to get back to our basics, what would they look like? I think we can name two, which are actually one. And that is the two great commandments, love God and each other. Simply put, we're to be lovers of God and people, period. Even our enemies, says Jesus. But before we can do that, we need to know what love is. Biblical love is a command, not affection. You cannot command one to have affection for someone. Love is not an emotional attachment to someone or a feeling. If we think of love in that way, then we don't know how to love, biblically. We think, I know I'm supposed to love so-and-so, but I just can't, I just can't stand him or her. How am I supposed to love? So then how are we supposed to? The word for love, agape, in the New Testament is used overwhelmingly as a verb. Love is not what you feel, it is what you do. It's an action. It's found, for example, in the Golden Rule. Do unto others what you would have them do unto you. Prior to Jesus, we find the rabbis and others saying, the negative side of this, don't, don't do to other people what you don't want done to yourself. Don't be part of the problem. Jesus is saying, be part of the solution. Do something that changes the outcome. Be active. Getting the picture? As you know, Jesus was good at telling parables to illustrate his point. And when he told the parable of the Good Samaritan, this despised person, who the people he was talking to could care less about, wanted to avoid, and didn't have any interest in their well-being. Those were the people he was speaking to. And when he landed the punch of that story about how this man was served by another man, not a Samaritan, who paid for his room in the inn and helped heal his wounds. He said to those people, go and do likewise. That's how you show love, by the doing. He probably of course, didn't know the Samaritan at all. The one who helped him, but it didn't matter. Do. I heard from a missionary a wonderful story about a prince in Africa whose father was the king. The prince became a Christian somewhere along the line, and his father exiled him to the outskirts of the tribe. There in the outskirts were the lepers, the cripples, the people who couldn't care for themselves. And so he built a hut and welcomed all of these despised and wretched people into his hut and cared for them. Ultimately, got sick himself. 
of a terrible disease. But before he died, the village in Hull became Christian by observing what, <coughs> what he did because he loved. Long before Christianity came to Africa, Africans lived by what they called Ubuntu. Unfortunately, it's not well known in the West. And if you were to ask an African what Ubuntu is, they might say something like this. Well, you know, in your world, you follow Descartes. I think, therefore, I am. We here in Africa say, you are, therefore I am. I am not me without you. But because of our Western understanding of the priority of the individual, we don't get that. We don't get that we need you to be me. And that others are the focus of our life beyond ourselves. And until we, we restore Ubuntu as a way of life, we'll continue perpetuating the problem because you are not me, and I don't like you not being me. The ethic that flows from this is that when someone in your community is suffering, you suffer right alongside them. If it means they're short on money and can't get the needs of life, that's your problem. And you're part of the solution. Diane and I have a Sikh family as dear friends. Fortunately, they own a restaurant. <laughs> and it's terrific. Well, we bought a car, and we decided to go have lunch at their restaurant and show off our new car. And they liked it, you know, oh, that's great, I'm glad you're enjoying it, it's a nice car. Now what are you going to give us? What? Well, we Sikhs believe that if you should have something wonderful happen to you, it's something you should share with others. And I went, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> but that's Ubuntu. That's real life. Yeah, you've got something wonderful. And because you have received a blessing, you need to bless as well. That's love. That's doing. That's taking another into consideration. Perhaps the most difficult of Jesus' teaching is that we're to love our enemies, even pray for them. And we're living in a time when enemy dating is a way of life. People are encouraged in America to fear the other. Watch out for immigrants, they're going to take your job. Watch out for Muslims, they're going to subvert your constitution and make you live under Sharia law. Watch out for the Chinese, they're going to give you COVID-19. Watch out for Democrats, they're really communists. <laughs> watch out for Republicans because they're fascists. Be afraid. Be very, very afraid. Well, you say, maybe I can pray for someone, but how can I love them when they're out to get me? Good question, and the answer is in the nature of love that we're asked to show our enemy. God's love is always directed toward a goal, and that goal is always the other's well-being. So to love someone as God intends is to act always for the well-being. Love is a verb. Love is something you do. Now I want to share with you something I recently read that illustrates the power 
of love <coughs> as an act. It comes from Christ in crisis, why we need to reclaim Jesus, by Jim Wallace, who some of you may know as the founder of a wonderful magazine called Sojourner. He writes this. <clears throat> In 2010, the infamous and fabricated Ground Zero Mosque story that was created by the right-wing media dominated cable news coverage. The media discussions about the new controversy were terrible, full of falsehoods about the nature and mission of this Islamic cultural center, the center of New York. Divisiveness and outright hatred toward Muslims reigned. I was in the middle of many of those ugly television conversations and was continually pleading with the network to broadcast some positive stories of Christian-Muslim relationships around the country, many of which were positive but almost entirely unpublicized. But on a pivotal Sunday morning, CNN aired a segment on this relationship between an evangelical Christian church and a group of Muslims in Tennessee. Here were two clergymen being interviewed together about the story of their meeting and how fellowship and friendship developed. You could tell by watching that these two clerks knew, respected, and liked each other. They even laughed together and were clearly friends now. The reverend and the imam told the story of how their communities had come together with still different faiths, but had learned how to communicate and even minister together in the community. I watched the show that Sunday morning and was moved to tears after trying to speak into the hatred and hateful media confrontations of that week. Two days later, I tracked down and called Pastor Steve Stone, who I didn't know then, just to thank him and his church and to tell him how proud I was to be a Christian that morning after watching the CNN story of Heart Song Church. Steve kindly thanked me for sojourn and said that he and many of his congregation had been subscribing for years. Can I tell you about a phone call I just had last night, he asked me, and I was eager to hear some good news. I got a phone call at two in the morning. <clears throat> Is this the pastor? The voice said, yes, this is Steve Stone. I replied, then the voice on the phone said, we are a room full of Muslim men calling from Kashmir, Pakistan, and we saw the CNN segment. We were all silent for a long time afterward. Then one of us said, I think God is speaking to us through that pastor. Another said, how could we ever kill these people? I must tell you what happened with another one of us, because he can't speak English to tell you himself. He went out to the small Christian church near our mosque, washed it clean with his Muslim hands. Now we are all back together calling him. Pastor, please tell your congregation that we don't hate them, we love them. And from now on, we will protect that little Christian church near us because of what you did. Center started because we felt we needed a family life center, a place for people to pray and play, to socialize, and have a sense of community. I love what I 
It is a difficult time for Muslims in America. We did not expect to be welcomed. We thought we have to work hard. And one day we were driving by and we see a banner. And that banner says, Art Song Church welcomes the Memphis Islamic Center to the neighborhood. Me and all my folks were thinking about leaving the church because I, I just did not accept what was going on. I went to Pastor Steve and asked him, I said, what, what are we doing? He told me to uh, read the Gospels. When I read through those Gospels and I figured out how was the problem? <laughs> what was going on with the world today? How was the problem? And then we started building. In the month of fasting, the month of Ramadan, was supposed to be our grand opening day where we start praying here, and it was clear that we were not going to have our hall ready. We got a call, and Bashar said, we just wondered if we could use your building for our prayers. In case we don't get our permit in time. Instead of using the room for a few nights, we ended up spending the entire month of Ramadan at Hartsong Church. Ramadan brought us much closer. People start knowing each other on a personal level. We've done coke drives and food drives and close to 9-11 we do a blood drive together. I would have never thought that I would be friends with Muslims right here. And I love their talent. My world got bigger. We are better congregation now. We are better people because of this friendship with Hartsong. It's an amazing friendship that I can't imagine having missed out on. How's everybody doing today? Would you allow her if you're having fun? Yeah. 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 If the American church can find its way back to the love that drives out hate, we will be able to say <clears throat> once again, world, rise up and walk. Amen. Amen. And salam alechem. Peace be with you. <laughs> I noticed that Pastor Janet has been offering an altar call after service late. I quit doing it because nobody came for so long. But I kind of want to give an altar call today before we sing our hymn. When God says, I love you, God is saying, I want you to be a part of my life. 
And our response to that is, I give my life back to you, and I will attempt to live my life as you would live in this world. That's our invitation as we stand and sing our song together. our financial offerings for the work of the church. One of my favorite scripture verses is Ephesians 5.2. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God. As we consider Christ's offering, that he gave himself for us, think about your offering and give as you are able.
years ago, I came upon a book called The Five Love Languages. It's by a pastor and counselor, Gary Chapman. He'd come to see that people give and receive for each other in ways that are akin to a language. He identified five such languages. One is quality time, spending time together intentionally focused on each other. A second is physical touch, a pat on the back, a hug, or a kiss. A third is acts of service, doing a chore or caring in some physical way for the other. Fourth is words of appreciation, compliments, or statements to another about how their actions had been, um, had made a difference. And finally, gifts, something tangible that is given to the beloved. People learn these languages um, of loving in much the same way you learn the language you speak. And we usually have a preferred language to express our love. He observed, this Gary Chapman observed, that if people do not speak the same love language, problems arise and sometimes the message of love is lost. The classic example is the husband who works long hours at work, acts of service, and the wife who values time spent together, quality time. When I first read about love languages, I was a manager for a dialysis unit. And when I read about them, I tried to figure out the love language of my staff members and speak to them in their preferred language. Denise liked hugs. Nancy liked to hang out in my office quality time. And almost everyone liked to get what we called a spirit gram. It was a little written note that said something about something they'd done that was especially nice. It was both words of appreciation and a gift. I'm pretty sure Jesus was fluent in all of these languages, but I began to think about the Last Supper and how Christ used them to demonstrate his love to the disciples. It occurred to me that the Last Supper itself was a demonstration of quality time. As Christ faced his death, he gathered those he loved and spent precious time with them. As he washed their feet, he performed an act of service that also involved physical touch. He spoke words of appreciation. You are those who have stood by me in my trials. And in offering the bread and the cup, he gave us the gift of communion. But perhaps most significant of all was the gift of himself, laying down his life for us. And the night of his betrayal and arrest, Jesus shared a meal with his friends. He took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his followers, saying, Share this bread among you. This is my body, which will be broken for justice. Do this to remember me. When supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Share this cup among you. This is my blood, which will be shed for the liberation. Do this to remember me. When we eat this bread and drink from this cup, we experience again the presence of Jesus in our midst. God of love, spirit of compassion, bless us at this bread and cup. May this meal be food and drink for our journey, renewing, sustaining, making us whole. Come, for the feast is spread.
this line in the final hymn, number 445. Beloved, may we uphold the image of God in all others, even those who would be our enemies, that we may once again be able to say to the world, rise up and walk. Amen. Amen. Amen.